Welcome to part two of my video about the video series section about um, chapter three. Um, I've already talked about things like uh, um, access control lists, permissions, uh, looking at you know, basic file information and metadata, etc. Um, this is also some file handling like this should also be fairly uh, familiar to you by now. Um, you'll find information about this in all of our resources. Um, the two big commands here are move and copy. The fun thing about these is that you can use sudo with these if you have to do something as a root. Um, say, for example, if you want to make a copy of a uh, configuration file in Etsy before you start messing with it, you can do cp, the name of the file, and then the name of the file again, dot, I don't know, bak, something like that, dot bk, something. Um, you can also move files. You can copy files. Um, from one location to another, if you have read access in one in the one place and and write access in the other um, to the directory itself, um, you can't very well uh, copy things out of a directory you can't read into a directory you can't write into. Now, one thing to be aware of is that when when you do this, when you copy, or even when you move, I, more more to the point, when you copy. Um, when you take the file, you put it in a new place, you're creating a brand new file um, in that new location. So what the uh, operating system is going to do is look at the default permissions, ownership, group ownership, etc., for that file that in its new location and do that. So say, for example, if you wanted to um, move a file from point A to point B, but preserve its group ownership and its user ownership and thus its permissions, you would have to pass it the dash lowercase p flag uh, to uh, preserve those settings. Um, this is what, and the, the, the fact that it will take the, the file from one location and drop it into another location and give it to the owner of the new location was a lot what allowed us, um, if you remember doing uh, VMware tools installation, um, in VMware Workstation in your uh, Debian VMs earlier in the course, you would you mount the um, VMware Tools ISO, and there's a tarball in there, a gzipped tarball. And of course, the first thing to do, because that directory belongs to the root user, um, the media itself, in a sense, in essence, belongs to the root user. You want to move it someplace where you can do with, uh, you can work on it as yourself. So you can copy it into your own home directory, say, um, cp um, uh, vmware tools dot tar dot gz um, space tilde to move it into your own home directory. And then when it ends up, you go into your own home directory, and there it is. But if you do ls-l, it belongs to you, not root, because CP, you didn't pass CP, the preserve flag, which allows you, of course, to unpack the, uh, to, to g-unzip um, the file, to unpack the tarball, to get into that directory, which also belongs to you and not to root, because the file you used to unpack belonged to you and not to root. You can go in there and then run the, uh, pr the uh, installation script. The other, the other thing we can do is the move command. The, uh, the thing to note here is that if you're moving a file from one location to another on the file system, from one directory to another on the file system, it will literally move the file. But if you want to change the name of the file, you can move it within the same directory from old name to new name, and we'll do the same thing. There is no rename command in uh, Linux or Unix, um, whereas in the DOS and Windows NT world, there's the move command and the delete command and the copy command and the rename command. Actually, strike that. Yes, there, there's all three. Um, but with with uh, Linux and Unix, you've got move and you've got copy. And of course, if you really want to know how to use the, what, want to look at closely how to use these, say preserving the metadata as the file is moving, you can actually look, do the man, use the man command or the info command to look at what you, all you can do with these files. Um, so let's talk about a mandatory access control. Um, now, this is another concept that comes to us that you will see again in the, sec in the Security Plus studies. 
Um, there, are well, there are more than one kind of access control. Most broadly, there's mandatory and discretionary. Um, discretionary access control, you may have access controls on the resource. Um, this implies to things like, um, oh, essentially, before uh, Windows NT um, and the much more granular permission system that came with the Windows NT operating system into the Windows computing world, your file permissions were essentially discretionary. Uh, you, the, you, the user, could change the permissions on a file if you wanted to, say, make it read-only or make it hidden or whatnot, but you didn't have to. Now that the concept of group and user ownership has meaning in the world of Windows computing, and by, by now I kind of mean in the last 20 years since, uh, since Windows NT has gotten into uh, and, yeah, in the, in the last 20 years, since Windows NT computing has gotten into the end-user computing space with, say, Windows 2000. Um, before Windows 2000, only folks um, who were using their computers at work had a reasonable chance of seeing Windows NT, and a lot of them even still had uh, Windows 98, Windows 98 SE, um, if they were not all that familiar, fortunate in their uh, computing choices, Windows Millennium. Um, when I just started out doing this, I still had some Windows uh, 98 users that I was supporting. Um, it's been a really long time since I've seen anything other than uh, Windows NT in either in in the business world or in uh, in private homes. Anyway, so mandatory access control. There is access control on the um, resources period full stop it is mandatory um, the system sets it up you can't turn it off um, one of the ways of doing this and there's more than one way uh, you might also hear about s app armor and some other tools se linux is one of the big ones security enhanced linux was actually developed um, i believe as a separate distribution by the national security administration the nsa um, and since then, SE Linux has made its way out into the rest of the Linux world, not as a distro unto itself, but as a layer of security that's built into a lot of different distros. Say, I, and I mentioned in the previous video, uh, discovering uh, that I could no longer easily achieve uh, single user access on my own uh, Fedora boxin because SE Linux was in the way. Uh, and it was in enforcing mode. Now, there are two basic modes for SE Linux, enforcing and permissive. Permissive will let you get away with things. Enforcing will not, obviously. You can also, uh, now, if SE Linux is there, you have to turn it on. Just installing it, it's like um, DHCP or um, HTTP or DNS or anything like that. Having it there and having it configured correctly are two totally different things. So you can, you can uh, activate it with SE Linux Activate. Then once, you, once you've got SE Linux turned on, and it's going to start protecting important things, including the background image. But most importantly, notice that it is protecting your Linux images and your initRD images. It's going to protect the file system itself and how it loads. Um, so it, it's a uh, a degree, it's a level of security, a layer of security deep down in the core of the operating system. Um, this is another application of our this concept of defense in depth. In the previous video series, I talked about uh, needing um, antivirus even on a Linux box. Um, one of the things that we we may explore a little bit later is firewalls. Um, there are a number of different ways to do that, IP chains, IP tables, etc. If you don't, if, if, um, if you're interested, um, there's a whole chapter on Linux security in the yellow book talking about firewalls and security, SE Linux, App Armor, Armor etc. I think it's probably chapter 13 or 14. I can't remember off the top of my head. In any case, um, so there's that outer layer of security where you're defending user land, antivirus, firewalls, host intrusion detection, that kind of thing. And then there's an inner layer of security. Um, and kind of honestly, some of the antivirus stuff should be protecting those inner layers of security. What's going on in Etsy? Um, who can, what's going on in your SBIN directories, your, your 
your uh, super users binary directories things like that also the image itself because of course if you can compromise the software the 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 uh, operating system itself you compromise everything that's sitting on top of it think about it in terms of our um a sort of a generic model of a uh, computer architecture so at your core you of course you've got the hardware outside of that you've got your kernel your operating system uh, outside of that you've got your applications outside of that you've got your users so if if you can compromise the user by social engineering that's one way of attacking the system if you can compromise the application attack the user attack down into the operating system that's another level if you can compromise the kernel itself um, that is full control of the entire system and you can even hide the, what you're doing so this is why SE Linux defends even the, the image of uh, the operating system itself. You can figure out what level of uh, enforcement you've got going on with the get enforce command. It'll either say um, zero or one, um, permissive or enforcing. You can also set that. Now, if you set that, you'll probably have to reboot the OS. Um, now, let's also talk about extended file attributes. Now, um, these are things like uh, and interesting, it's the same image. Um, okay, so your extended file attributes use what we call namespaces to indicate um, degrees of uh, the attributes that are applied and degrees of control. There's the user space, the trusted space, the security space, and the system space. The package for this is ATTR. Um, this may be roughly analogous to the attrib. Um, the attributes um, on a Windows system, though honestly, um, the attributes in Windows function very differently. The attributes on a metadata in a Windows box uh, control things like compression, the hidden bit, read-only, the archive bit, things like that. With this, we're going to into a good deal more depth. So you can set your attribute names, um, and you can decide... Um, what users can do what with it? Um, say, it can it can a user do a certain uh, have a, 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 have a, um, make a certain change uh, or um, run a certain operation against a specific file, or can a trusted user, or can the security system or the system itself do it? Um, it's like an, a, it's another view, shall we say, of permissions. Um, finally, there's LDAP. Um, let's see. Oh, that didn't page. LDAP. So, um, LDAP is something we discussed in a previous module. This runs using the SLA, uh, the SLAP daemon or LDAP utils. Um, LDAP is a non hierarchical is a hierarchical, uh, but not um, relational database system. Um, roughly uh, compliant with the X500 standard. Um, Netware's uh, um, tree system worked on with using uh, on the on the same lines as LDAP. Honestly, even um, Active Directory does because um, what we really care about here, LDAP of course stands for the Lightweight uh, Directory Access Protocol. Um, so we're talking about the directory. Of course, is the uh, the database of objects available to a system, printers, people, computers, places, lots of different attributes. And the reason that a relational database doesn't work very well is that different kinds of users and different kinds of objects have different attributes, and those attributes can change over time. Um, so you get something that looks um, more like a list of attributes and less like um, a row in an SQL based table. In fact, the, the databases here are what we would call as no SQL, what we, what we would refer to as no SQL databases. Um, you can set up user creation, user access, you can reconfigure it. This thing, the L, uh, HT, uh, PHP LDAP admin, this is an L, a PHP front end to your um, LGAP admin screen. So you can look at your schemas, you can import, export, log in, log out. Um, 
if you're going to play with this, you're probably going to play with this in, by 